First of all, I would like to extend my heart felt gratitude to Imam Hussein organization and all the volunteers who have given me the opportunity and the blessing to be able to um, deliver this uh, lecture, which is somewhat a little bit different than what people are used to, but I think it provides a newer perspective onto, um, you know, the actual neuroscience of Azadari or the way Azadari has shaped our mind and the way we have then um, reshaped Azadari um, in line with the traditions of our cultures and societies that we live in. When you come to think about Azadari, the tradition of Azadari started the moment Imam Hussein uh, was born. When Prophet peace be upon him was informed, he ran towards where the baby was. He held the baby in his arms and said that this is the one that's purified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Hussain held him, held the baby, kissed the baby, even though the baby was not cleaned up. And then he started to cry. Those were the first tears of Azadari. And this is when the tradition of Azadari was set up. This is what Prophet then, um, you know, related and everybody was amazed as to why Prophet was so happy and anxious that he dashed towards the baby and then he started to cry. And when asked, he said that this son of mine will be crucified and killed and martyred in, in the desert of Karbala. And then Bibi Fatima Salam Allah said that, Oh Prophet of Allah, wouldn't you be around? And and he said, no, neither will Ali, Hassan, or you. This child will be with his own loved ones in the sands in the desert of Karbala. Those first tears set the stage for Azadari. So that really is the foundation and the building block. And then the Prophet, peace be upon him, took a bottle of dirt, which he gave to Bibi Umm Salma, referring to her, suggesting to her that keep this bottle when this dirt turns red, my son Hussein would have been sacrificed and martyred in the desert of Karbala. That was the first shair, the symbol, the tabarruk you can call of Azadari. Um, and that was again laid by Prophet, peace be upon him. So the tradition of Azadari is something that is really not new. And the Prophet is the founder of this Azadari. And then Bibi Fatima Salamullah asked the Prophet that if no one, no one will be there, who will then mourn my son and his family? The Prophet said, Allah will create a nation who will mourn, whose Children will mourn that the children of Hussein and also whose adult will mourn Imam Hussein and his adult and the ladies will mourn the household of Prophet peace be upon him and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Those were the Azadars and we are actually the blessings and the miracle of Bibi Fatima salamullah alayhi's dua which was in really narrated by Prophet, peace be upon him. So this 
really sets the stage for Azadari as we see it. My today's topic is a really little bit different because when you think about Azadari, which is the concept of really things in your mind or in your brain, many people have come up with different theories, the different ideas. And some people believe that, um, and it was really um, uh, Dean Homer in 2004, he wrote a book called um, The God Gene. And the idea was that all of this spiritual uh, attachment, so spirituality, because the sacrifice of Imam Hussein was, was to lead us to uh, the greater, you know, and almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said that, there are certain genes which are specific to our spirituality and our belief in God. And he called that particular gene, um, after an extensive research, he called that gene vesicular monoamine transporter 2. That gene, he thought, was the one that was responsible for our spirituality and all other aspects. And there has been controversy around that gene as well. Many people believe that that particular, um, you know, gene is meant to be knocked out by, um, you know, through vaccines and others. So that's the conspiracy theory. For, that's for another day. But the idea was that this gene, particular gene, which encodes two, um, you know, monoamines, the neurotransmitters, which is uh, dopamine, serotonin, and also the third one is norepinephrine, that these hormones alter the actual state of an individual, making them spiritual or leading them towards spirituality. So that was really the idea. And he proposed that there is a gene and this gene of the genetic component could be inherited. But, you know, the interesting thing is that even uh, worms and fruit flies and, um, you know, snails that we have, you know, only twice the number of genes from them, they also possess this gene. So if his theory was correct, then one would have seen beavers building mosques and temples and churches, and we would have seen ants lined up, um, you know, for our daily or our communal prayers. And that doesn't really happen. So this, for me, did not explain the genetic basis of spirituality and our attachment. There had to be something really different. And this is what my topic today is that I will discuss the neuroscience of Azadari as how Azadari has really impacted our brains and how our, our brains have then reshaped the tradition of Azadari that after 1400 years have passed, that whenever Alam of Hazrat Abbas salam, appears, we are transported to 1400 years back. No other tradition, no other tragedy in the world has been recapitulated so intensely with such great passion and compassion than the actual Azadari of Sayyid al-Shuhada Imam Hussain alayhi salam. So I am going to explore with you the actual, you know, the neuroscience basis in my postulate and hypothesis is that it is actually our brain um, you know, that has been impacted by Azadari. This is the very brain that Yazid and Banu Umayyah and their clans, you know, Banu Abbas wanted to alter so that we will not be able to really keep this, the tradition of Azadari alive. So um, please bear with me. I have to give you a little bit of background about neuroscience and the brain and before we embark into its impact on Azadari. So the question really is, how did the tradition of Azadari impact our brain? That's a really an important question. Why is it that after so many years that have passed, we feel on the day of Ashura as if it was happening live and it was real? So how did the brain then help shape Azadari? That's also an important question because brain is highly plastic. It adapts. If it doesn't adapt, to ever-changing environments, we would not be able to reconcile its effectiveness, its functionality with the events that we are trying to revive or recapitulate. So this is something really, really important, important to remember. We know that, you know, there are brain cells, um, there are, you know, tens of billions of brain cells. We have more brain cells in our brain than there are stars in the Milky Way. And these brain cells, they inter 
connect with each other through special structures we call synapses. So I am talking to you right now. Um, you know, I am speaker, so I am the pre-synapse, so the brain cell that is talking. You are receiving this information. You are the recipient. You are the postsynaptic cell. And then the communication media that we are using is the is actually the synapse through which we communicate. And these synapses are, are remarkable. They change all the time. Whenever we learn something new, um, these synapses are the ones that drive all of those aspects. So we have really neuronal circuits. They will be shaped and connected, um, you know, as per the time and also our life experiences. But they are also highly dynamic. The change, we call it plasticity. And this plasticity gives rise to behavior, which we exhibit, you know, uh, different parts of the brain in, in our life. So all brain functions, they rely on these neuronal circuits. And it's really something uh, very important. Neuroscience cannot answer questions. For example, it cannot answer a question, when was this universe created? When will it end? Um, is there a purpose to the creation of the universe? Um, and is there a God you know, that reaches out to me? Or is it that I am to reach out to God? And how these all aspects really shape my beliefs and faiths. Neuroscience cannot answer those questions. But what neuroscience can do, it can measure the impact of these, you know, extrinsic inputs. So the outside inputs onto our brain that then elicit a particular behavioral repertoire in our personality. So when you think about God, the, the moment you start thinking about God, an incredibly amazing thing happens. Our brain circuits begin to change. Their connectivity is enhanced significantly. And it, the, the networks become even more complex. And the more you can template and think about God uh, or Allah or Imam Hussein alayhi salam, the more complicated more complex our brain circuits become. And these brain circuits are unique to our own personal experiences and faiths and beliefs. So you cannot really reconcile two individuals and put them in the same boat. And that is really an important takeaway that I will drive some important conclusions from. So as you think, you know, for some people who are not really thinking about God or about Imam Hussein or the tragedy of Karbala, very nominal changes occur in their brain. And then the God would appear to them as a statue or an idol or something else. Whereas if you can con con contemplate more and more, your brain circuits release neurotrophic factors, which enhance these synaptic connections. And once these synaptic connections are enhanced, then the actual God or the concept will appear very, very real to you. So this is really something very important that in continuum of Azadari, the reason that it has imprinted permanent, you know, mark on our, our brain circuits is the recapitulation of the incidents of, um, of Karbala. And I think this is something that is really important. And so we can record the impressions that are, or the, you know, occurring as a result of our meditation, thoughts, majlis, matam, and other aspects. So neuron to neuron synapses, and the synapse is, as I said, is a contact point between two brain cells. And this is in the center frame that you could see. I have put a little box. This is the contact point where electrical impulses, they turn into a chemical signal. A neurotransmitter is released. This neurotransmitter activates the connected neuron. So when you hear something, it will actually trigger the synaptic connections in our auditory cortex in the brain. And then it will elicit a particular behavioral repertoire depending upon our, our experiences. And now here is another important takeaway. Most people, they come to majalis, they get tabarruk. The tabarruk is the blessing of the person who is actually giving that niyaz or the tabarruk. But you know what? The actual tabarruk of Imam Hussain alayhi salam is really these new synaptic connections that are formed in our brain during majlis and they allow us to learn um, you know different aspects of history and also get you know cognitive um, imperative 
which will allow us to understand Imam Hussain the way he is to be understood. So these synaptic connections are actually tabarruk of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. These are the gift of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And these are the ones that have changed our mind, not the food that we get. This really is the tabarruk, is the food for our um, you know, connections. So brain is biological. We know that brain is biological, but our thoughts and feelings and beliefs, they are beyond observable and measurable. And this is something that is really, really important to, uh, to understand. Neuroscience cannot really um, get and measure how much someone feel empathy about Imam Hussain, how sad it is, and where they are in terms of their you know, personal self. Um, um, uh, you know, during majlis or other incidents, we cannot, but we can measure these by indirectly through recording brain activity or doing various techniques, um, you know, how we feel, uh, the biological thought process, feelings, you know, and beliefs, and they are beyond observable and measurable. And we should not really try to compartmentalize people or to really stigmatize certain particular group that they don't do this and they don't do this. It really is a very, very personal experience um, uh, to, uh, to understand. So the more a person thinks about God, the more complex and imaginative are, you know, um, their concept or the nuances of the brain uh, really circuit, um, the concept becomes. Um, taking on a unique nuances of meaning, and, and these meanings will differ from one individual to another. As I said, now, if we can template God long enough and uh, something surprising happens in our brain, as I said earlier, the neuronal functioning begins to change. So also, when you're thinking about Imam Hussain and thinking a lot in the context of his sacrifice, his stature, the brain's functionality will change. Neural circuits and sometimes actually unique neural circuits become activated. New dendrites will form, new synaptic connections are established, and our brain becomes more sensitive to subtle realms of experiences. Our perceptions will alter, our beliefs begin to change, and if God has meaning to us, then God becomes neurologically real. This really is what the concept of the entire Azadari is that wherever God's concept reside in the you know in our geniculate nuclei in the brain, which provides us you know empathy, kindness, graciousness, sense of sacrifice, those are the particular neural circuits that we will nurture, and those circuits in turn become stronger and they strengthen, and as a result, what happens is that the actual uh, you know Imam Hussain becomes functionally real. And we could record, you know, these responses over time and um, time and again. And, uh, and as the activity is enhanced, repeated majalis repertoire will allow our brain circuits to get even stronger and stronger. So for some, you know, God may remain a primitive concept, as I said earlier, limited to the way that a young, you know, child interprets the God or the world. But for the most people, God transforms into a symbol or a metaphor representing a wide range of personal, ethical, social, and universal values. So this is something that's really important because Imam Hussein alayhi salam, similar to the concept of God, will transform uh, our personality depending upon how we perceive and how we see him and, and his sacrifice in the context of personal sacrifice. So this is something really important. Now, let me tell you a story. After a long discussion with a Canadian, uh, you know, Anglo-Canadian lady, she converted and she became Shia. So one day she asked me, she says, Dr. Sayed, can I ask you something? I said, sure. She said, I, you know, I am sitting with these young children attending majlis. The moment Imam Hussain, Bibi Zainab Salamullah, Hazrat Abbas, Bibi Sakina, and, and also Hazrat Ali Azgar's name comes up. I see these big tears that ooze out of their eyes and just like the dew drops on the petal of a, a flower, a rose, they trickle down their faces. And she said, I don't feel that way. 
Why is it that I don't feel that way that the children do? And they are very innocent. You know, they, it's very difficult for them to create emotion. But these emotions, where do they come from? And I had a long discussion with her and I said to her, you know, if you ask from a neuroscience perspective, you know, the emotions which are um, happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, surprise, they are unconscious. These are unconscious responses. And, you know, our brain, uh, the unconscious component of our brain scans 1.2 million frames per second, whereas the conscious part only scans 42 frames. Uh, thousand frames per second. So I said, you know, this is really an unconscious. This is in mostly instinctive and it's neurological, but it involves your brain and, and it also relies upon cognition. You know, the cognition that you have, you know, you have to have the knowledge and the know-how. You have to really see what the little bait salam were. And if you are related to them cognitively, what will happen is that you will actually get this aspect uh, really uh, uh, incredibly implanted in your in, into your into your brain. So I think um, it's something something that's really um, you know important for us to uh, think about um, really the unconscious uh, aspects neurological and they they rely on cognitions so this is really the subcortical region which is amygdala we call it ventromedial prefrontal cortex cortex or cortices these are the ones that are involved in all of these responses that are triggered in our mind or in our brain so this is something very different than feelings you can feel something but emotions are really ingrained and these are really instinctive and neurophysiologically contained so during or soon after uh, the actual tragedy of Karbala, Bibi Zainab Salamullah Aleha delivered lectures. Not only uh, did she deliver lectures in, um, in the marketplace, but she also delivered lectures um, in, the, um, in the court of Yazid. Um, but then she knew that people will hear because they're hearing through their auditory cortex. And when they hear, they will forget. So the first thing uh, that Bibi Zainab Salamullah Aleha did when she was released, she asked for all the tabarrukat to be brought. And when the, the, the blood-stained shirt of Imam Hussein was presented, the sack of Bibi Sakina was presented, the alam of Hazrat Abbas, the flag of Hazrat Abbas was presented, and then the actual burned-out cradle of Janabi Ali Azhar was presented. She held a majlis. That was the first majlis first foundation of Azadari, and that was an impact on the brain like nothing else. So what actually happened there was that she then used the visual cortex of your brain with the auditory cortex. And when she imprinted this, this image was permanently imprinted on the brain. And this is one of the reasons that our brain, when it sees the alam of Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam, or the cradle of Janabi Ali Asghar alayhi salam, or the sack of Bibi Sakina, our brain transports us back 1400 years ago. This was an absolute miracle on the impact of these things on the brain. So the brain was really transformed at that time. The, the auditory and the visual cortex were aligned. And that was really one of the greatest contributions of Bibi Zainab Salamullah Alaiha. So the brain activity of Azadar, we also know that the when you're recording the activity, unfortunately, I don't have time, but we have done research on the tears that are shed for Imam Hussein and the chemical components of those are really unique and very different than what you see in, in painful tears or other tears. So brain activity of Azadar decreases in the parietal lobe. And when this happens, one sense of self, it begins to dissolve, allowing the person to feel unified with the incidents or the events of Karbala or those who were in Karbala. We, the same thing happens when we pray during Salat and Namaz. We lose the self. This is where the brain center, your superior geniculate nuclei, are actually activated. The blood is all transferred in that area and we lose who we are in front of Imam Hussein. We feel ourselves worthless and this is why people crawl on their 
needs. And this is what, you know, um, um, uh, Jabir bin Ansari, when he came to Karbala, he, he, he actually traveled looking for the grave of Imam Hussein on his hands and knees just wanted to make sure that he would not step on the blood of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. So this is really what you forget about yourself. When people go for ziyarat, they forget who they are. It doesn't matter you are a king or you are really a slave, you know, a servant in a, um, at a, you know, a small officer somewhere. We lose ourselves and we connect ourselves to Karbala and Imam Hussain. This also really involves our parietal lobe in our brain. And this is something that's really, really unique that Azadari does to us. Azadari is also a neurological transporter. So did some experiments on these individuals who um, actually had, um, you know, and one person had uh, the ear pods the, and they were put inside the magnet and one was asked to read a story or tell a story. So that person was telling a story and depending upon two hormones, the three hormones, cortisol, oxytocin and vasopressin, this individual got completely transported into the situation of the main character of the story. So with someone who depends upon the actual amount of these hormones and transmitters released from the amygdala and other parts of the brain, this individual transports himself directly into Karbala. And when this individual sees Imam Hussein with so many arrows on his body, still dangling from the horse and falling onto those arrows, he feels the same way and he takes out Zanji and then he really feels the same way and he tries to emulate. So in that sense, the person who is also listening to story feels the same way. So our majalis is, are actually the transporters. They transport us into Karbala and that narrative remains really very um, you know, consistent and, and uh, this is one of the reasons I always remind our ulama and, and our speakers that the story of Karbala must not change. It should stay consistent. We should not really deform or create new answers to this particular story because then it confuses the mind and then the narrative really changes as well. So this really Azadari is a neurological transporter. No one else but the Alhamdulillah, the Shias, um, have this particular transporter that allows us to be transported to Karbala. And we feel uh, the, the pain and the sufferings the way the actual characters in Karbala would have felt and, and suffered. So, so what Yazid did was that he really attacked that particular system in our brain. I mean, he decapitated Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Yes, he killed them all. He could have left them. But what Yazid wanted to do was something really drastic. And that was meant to scare the generations yet to come because he decapitated Imam Hussain alayhi salam, trampled the bodies of all the supine bodies of Imam Hussain and his companions with horses. Then they put their heads on the spears, paraded them through the streets and the families, and you know, so that the idea was to really activate the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus in the minds of all the Shias and the followers of Ahlul Bayt, and even the family of Ahlul Bayt, scare them to an extent that they would never ever be able to uh, really raise their heads. And then this relates to a little experiment that was done by John Watson, and, and these experiments won't be allowed. So what he did was that he had this young baby, and he exposed the baby to a furry um, little thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it could be a furry uh, mouse or a rabbit or a monkey um, and even a face that was furry or a dog. He exposed them. And then what he did was that as the child or the baby was coming or approaching a mouse, he made a loud bang noise behind him and that scared the baby for life. So even after this, if the baby was then presented with even soft, cuddly toys, nothing actually, um, he would still be scared and have post-traumatic stress disorder. We did experiments on these rats, whereby the rat was exposed to cherry blossom for the first time, and then the rat, rat was shocked. Um, uh, and then for the rest of his life, whenever that rat will feel, um, you know, smell the cherry blossom, it will freeze 
and exhibit post-traumatic stress disorder. If you took their its babies, they will feel the same way. Their babies will, will feel the same way. So even if you artificially inseminated, you know, a female through a male sperm that was scared or shocked, they will also feel the same way. So Bani Maya and Banu Abbas wanted to do was to create a post-traumatic stress disorder in our brains. So whenever we will think and feel, see them uh, or hear their name, we will freeze. We will freeze. Alhamdulillah, what Azadari has done. So, um, you know, the um, what we, when we look at the impact of long-term stress that Banu Umayya and Banu Abbas and then the Yazid's crony tried to um, impart on our brain would have caused our not only our brains to shrink, like you see in this particular case, but it would have also turned us into a post-traumatic stress disorder, which would have really been an intergenerational going from one generation to another one. And we would not have been able to live and survive or even be able to really, um, you know, live a normal life. But Alhamdulillah, the actual essence of the the beauty of our azadari is such that we only have maybe 10 minutes of masaib that we decide, but the, for the 40 minutes that the time we have, we are exposed to uh, really our unconditional love towards Ahlul Bayt. We listen to Fazail of, uh, you know, Masumin alayhi salam. We know the, the valor of uh, Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam as he entered the river. And, and then notwithstanding that he had conquered the river, he still managed to really not to drink. And he showed his valor and by obeying the imam of his time and not taking his sword out for the fight. So we also know Imam Ali alayhi salam's valor with how he single-handedly brought down the armies of, you know, of Mushrikeen and Kuffar down to their knees and how he single-handedly conquered Khaybar. So Khaybar, Khandak, you know, all of these battles where Imam Ali salam single-handedly not only saved Islam, but also saved the pride of Prophet, peace be upon him, um, are the ones that are recited during Majalis, which brings in a sense of really an, an incredible satisfaction and respect from Masumin. And this breaks away or breaks down that you know, um, the stressful events of Karbala and then the tragic uh, events of Karbala and the tyranny of Yazid and Bani Umayya, that they flattened the shrines of our Masumin. People who went for ziyarat, their hands were cut off, their legs were cut off, and then we, our blood was used to make the palaces of Bani Umayya. We were poured live into, into the walls of their palaces you know, we would not have been able to survive. And yet these majalis, whereby we have the valor, we have the stature, and we also have the, the actual unconditional love for our masumin, that has enabled us. So my really, um, you know, um, important point takeaway is that we must show our passion during these majalis. The Nara Hadri, for example, is the one that detoxifies. It really breaks down or shatters in our minds the actual you know, post-traumatic stress disorder that they have uh, conveyed. So I think it's also important to realize that you know, when we are doing Azadari, each and every individual will exhibit a very different level of transportation. Some people will transport to the level that they only feel, you know, uh, sadness in their hearts. Other people will have tears pour down. Some people will do matum for themselves and the others do, you know, other kinds of acts to show their passion. Please show respect to them because this is their level of transportation. Our level of transportation may be very different. And also it's important that the people chant, you know, Nara Hadri or Ya Ali, they recite it because Muawiya for 10 years, he prevented the name of Ali being even uttered from the member. And then for 300 years, Bani Umayya didn't allow it. This is one of the reasons that Janab Ammar Yasir, when he had his tongue cut off because he was chanting Ali, 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 um, even though he could not say Ali, 
he was shouting, Ali, Ali, and people were chanting, Ali, Ali, Ali. So these are the traditions of Azadari, the love for Ahlul Bayt, that must continue in our generation. If we took away this passion, this level of expression, a matami comes out on the streets and he takes out jalous and he does matam, his pledge to Imam Hussain is the way that they have forgotten, they have forgotten Ghadir, I shall not let them forget Karbala. And so these are the really important shair of Imam Hussain, the shair of Azadari, we need to respect and we need to continue with these shair, shairs of Azadari, the symbols of Azadari, if we are to prevent, uh, you know, uh, preserve the, the message of Karbala, which was that Halmin Nasir in Yansurna. Is there anyone who will come to my help? We come out in the Jalusis, chanting Labbaik Ya Hussain, Labbaik Ya Hussain. This really is a, a imprinted on our brain, which then gets transferred to our younger generation. And Alhamdulillah, they will continue with this uh, tradition of Azadari, just like a relay race. If we drop the baton, our entire efforts for 1400 years, our gener in, you know, intergenerational efforts will all go to waste. So Azadari is our juggler Wayne. Azadari is our identity. Azadari is a majlis, a university, which really incites, e activate each and every part of our brain. Um, you know, and no other uh, community or faith group will have a majlis or Azadari whereby children are sitting, women, elderly, we talk about history, philosophy, Quranic teaching, Islamic teaching, conscious, human conscious, all these aspects are taught in our majalis and Imam Hussein's majalis is a transformative. It transfers us to into Karbala, but also transforms our brain to exhibit empathy, kindness. You will never see a Shia blowing himself up in the mosques because this is really the actual blessing of Azadari upon us. Um, and you know, I would once again like to thank everyone for the opportunity. The topic is really vast. Maybe inshallah the next time we will get more into deeper into detail. Wassalam, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.